Hey you folks, Quill18 here, and welcome to a special video on Total War Warhammer 2. This week I will be live streaming over twitch.tv slash Quill18, an exclusive playthrough of the Lizardmen campaign. But before we dive into that on stream, what I want to do is make a video here taking a look at the Lizardmen faction, taking a look at their starting situation and what their units are, and invite people in the comments to try to work out, you know, a bit of analysis and a little bit of strategizing about how we might want to approach this campaign. So what we're going to do first is we're going to dive into just the campaign. We're going to look at it. We're not going to take a turn. We're not going to be playing. We're just going to be looking at the setup, taking a look at the Lizardmen buildings, and trying to figure out a plan for a possible expansion. So we'll just I hit new campaign over here. Good. There are two Lizardmen met factions to choose from. Uh, there is the one led here by Lord Mazdamundi, one of the Slan. These giant, like, toad or frog-like, mega psychic, magic-using, immortal, uh, really, 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 really powerful leaders of the Lizardmen. Lizardmen are actually comprised of a handful of different species, and we'll look at that when we get into the game. So, this is the... the I would... I would define this as the primary faction of the Lizardmen in Warhammer 2, most likely. It does rate the initial challenges relatively easy. It does look like the initial expansion is going to be uh, pretty straightforward. And then after that, of course, you just run into everyone else anyway, so it doesn't make much of a difference. And then we've got the last defenders over here, uh, which are led by... looks like a Saurus guy, this Krukgar over there. A different faction of the Lizardmen over here. Some sort of um, um, offshoot, I guess. But we will be going with the primary primary one over here, Lord Mazda Mundi in the capital of Hexwaddle, and uh, we're going to go ahead and start. Now, I'm going to let the cutscene play through for you guys, so sit back and listen to that, and we'll come back afterward. Since the days of creation... The reptiles have dominated the jungle continent of Lustria. The ignorant call the creatures lizard men. The wise know them as defenders of the world. <laughs> In ages past, the Old Ones had a plan. But then the Stellar Gates collapsed, the Old Ones fled, and demons flooded the mortal plane. Led by the Slan, the Lizard Men fought the demons that surged across Lustria. Yet, it was the Elves that created the Great Vortex. Swirling maelstrom that siphoned the world of chaos, withering demon kind. The world was saved, but the vortex endures only because it is bolstered by the power of the Slan via the Great Warding. If the warding should fail, the demons will return. The forked tongue of Sotex hangs low in the sky. The slam have felt it. Now I see it brighter, clearer. Its hiss disturbs the winds of magic. Look, Tagrax, the sacred plaques. One prophecy shines above all others. Vortex of the warm blood. meaning cannot be deciphered if our master will not wake we journey to the city of the sun
So I do have to say, it's not just the volume of the video. Um, the cutscene voice volume seems a little low. I do have it, like, raised pretty high there. So if you guys had to sort of squint your ears, if that makes any sense to listen. Uh, it's not just you. Don't worry about it. That's just the way it kind of is. I, I think it's partially just because of the way the lizard men talk. That weird sort of a hissy, growly kind of thing. Uh, and some of the other uh, races are maybe a little closer to sort of standard English or something like that. A little bit of flavor text here. Uh, hopefully I still have time to read it. I think there's going to be a button to push to continue. Let's see. Lord Mazdamundi is now fully roused and ready to enact his interpretation of the Great Plan. The spawnings are gathering at the City of the Sun. And no, apparently not. Never mind. Here I don't think they're actually speaking English. Premonitions of a corrupting evil. Ah, it goes too fast. Plaques of the old ones must be sought, for only the wisdom of our ancient forefathers can show us the way. So we get sort of a panning view of our content here. I do have the campaign introduction mode turned off, so we won't go through the tutorial. The comet has driven the warm bloods to madness. Turn your keen eyes against those that raise our jungles and steal our relics. Their eradication must come first. Those that trespass against the Great Plan, in capitals, must suffer the consequences, my children. The will of the Old Ones must be fulfilled. So we start at Hexwaddle over here. I believe that means City of the Sun or something. I think there was a reference to it somewhere. Um, I don't know if it was before this or after this, but I think that's what it is. All right. So we get some info right away about how this faction slash race plays here. First of all, the Geomantic Web. So every race in this game has a particular mechanic for generating uh, most like magical power and things like that for use in the great sort of rituals over here. Um, there's a couple of different variants for that, but one of the things that the Lizardmen have are this, this geomantic um, uh, web that we can highlight over here in a moment, which I will do. Lizardmen and settlements are linked by an unseen network of power that spans the world. By increasing the power of the geomantic web in a province, a lizardman faction can increase the potency of any commandments issued there. Bless spawnings. The spawning pools of Lustria will occasionally bring forth an especially gifted set of warriors, which may be recruited once a special mission is completed. So um, I think in the lore, lizardmen don't breed in the traditional sense. I think they just have these giant spawning pools that occasionally burst forth a uh, series of lizardmen of various types of lizardmen sub-races, for example. Um, and and then, yeah, and here in the campaign, we sometimes get really special spawnings. We got our first mission over here, Temporal Enhancement. Ensure that one of the following buildings has been constructed. Make a temple precinct and get some money. Okay, that's fine. Again, we're not going to be looking to actually play right now until we start our, um, our 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 live stream over here so we're not going to be taking any actions we've got initial setup so to start off with and i believe this is pretty standard we have a single city over here we've got our capital of hexwaddle in the province that is ismith of lustria over here which comprises the monolith of the fallen gods and the ziggurat of dawn so i think it's pretty fair to say that we're going to focus on taking those two cities first so that we gain control of the province the bonus if you don't know uh to if you control all three settlements in a single province is that at that point you get to issue a commandment which will give you a buff to um all a variety of different things in the province either more order um more magic a different ability to recruit things and so on and so forth you can here see here it says geomantic web strength one if i click this button over here we can actually see the geomantic web that we've access to adjacent cities are linked to one another through this web by strengthening the connection between the cities by by claiming more of these as well as building certain types of buildings in the cities you can level up your geomantic web and you can see here to get to level five strength we'd have to build say the geomantic lotus the stronger the web, the stronger our commandments over here. So that's one of the mechanics here. The other core mechanic in Warhammer 2 in general is that there are these rituals that people can perform, and these are related uh, to, I believe, one of the victory conditions. Again, I haven't actually played through it yet. But our victory objectives, Vortex victory, complete all rituals, then win the following battle. 
the final battle over here. Alternatively, you can go for a domination victory by wiping out all the other factions. I think it's all the factions, at least some number of factions over here. So the standard victory will involve completing all these rituals, and everyone's got this kind of mechanic in general. Um, every race has some way to accumulate points that they can then go, when they reach a certain milestone, complete a ritual. In the case of us as the Lizardmen, we require ancient plaques. Lizardmen um, track their history and lore and, and um, uh, sort of pro prophecies, that sort of thing, on these golden plaques. Now, we produce a few from buildings. Right now, we're producing one per turn, which isn't much. We need 350 for the first level, for example. Um, better buildings will produce more plaques. There are quite a few different ways to get plaques as a reward for quests as well. Certain locations have more plaques um, hidden in them as well. There's, um, there's some stuff further to the north that we will see, for example, that's got that. Uh, so we will be looking to try to accumulate our plaque production so that we can progress through these rituals and hopefully beat people as much as possible. Of course, we also, just like everyone else, have to worry about gold and our treasury over here. Now, our neighbors over here, um, I don't even know if they have, like, an actual diplomatic presence. Can I not, uh, click here? Oh, it's the Skeggy. I might be able to double-click to, to load up their, um, their diplomatic view. I'm not sure. Right now, we have we only know of a few different people. So the Skeggy are a faction of Norska over here. Cannot negotiate with them. We're just going to have to go ahead and wipe them out. All of them that are next door over here. They've actually got a settlement in the Settlers Coast province as well. The other things we know about are the Blue Viper Orc tribes to our south. The Skaven, and you notice when I click on this, it doesn't actually move my camera in any way. I actually don't know where these Skaven are. We've also got the oh, cool. Southern Realms New World Colonies over here. We've got some humans. Now, the part of the reason we probably don't know where the Skaven are is because Skaven cities show up as ruins on the map. Now, this might be an uninhabited ruin that we can move units to and search for treasure and or decide to colonize. However, it might also be, all of these things might actually be Skaven settlements over here. We won't know until we get there. Now, um, we don't really have much other info available to us at this time. However, I have poked around enough to know that to the north we will have some Dark Elves, for example, um, and to south I think there'll be some more Norska and some more Orcs going down that way. Now, one of the things that is important when you are playing here is that there are different types of terrain, and different races have preferences for terrain. We like grassland and jungle. These are 100% compatible for us. We mouse over here. Um suitable climate you see and on the coast over here that's jungle suitable climate those are okay we're, we're perfectly fine at settling all these places very happy when we get into these mountains i do not believe the lizard folk the lizard men like settling into mountains as such oh there's some grassland over here there might be some different type of stuff going on as such we might have a problem expanding further north beyond a certain point same thing might happen further south now i don't know if we actually have to get to the actual vortex which is over here and if we do i don't know how we get there no idea how the mechanics work this is the edge of the map over here uh, when, uh, sometime after release of Warhammer 2, you will be able to play a super grand campaign combining the worlds of both Warhammer 1 and 2, because they're, they're next to each other somewhere, um, and play this super mega campaign with all the factions enabled, which is pretty crazy sauce. That's if you own both, both versions of the game. So that's, that's geographically our initial setup. Clearly, our first plan will be to go and beat up the Skeggy over here, reclaim this. Now, we'll have to make a decision whether or not we're going to go to war with the New World Colonies. I mean, probably we're going to take the actual settlement of Skeggy over here, for example, which is the capital of Settlers Coast, and we may then be tempted to go for Port Rieger and Swamp Town over here. On the other hand, the Skaven, I mean little filthy disgusting underground creatures assuming this is where they are over here that's something else that we'll probably want to to focus on and peek around i'm sure we'll get some developments of quests we might find out about specific places that hold plaques that sort of thing okay so that's the end of i would say the geographic overview let's take a look at the building setup over here we will also be looking at all the unit types and try to figure out what kind of military composition we're looking for um rather than look at that in the campaign what i might go out and do is back out and go to the custom battle map and that should list all the units available that you can add to your army in the custom battle and that'll be a good place maybe to see the full list of units anyway we're gonna click over here now when we look at a city and by the way if you if you haven't really played this um each city has its sort of main building over here here, which is sort of like 
the size of your city. Um, this one has to grow organically through a growth meter. Each province has a growth meter over here. You accumulate a certain amount of growth per turn. Each time you hit the growth milestone, you get a surplus population point. And it is by spending this surplus population point that you can upgrade the main building. You can see to go to this rank here to unlock the temple precinct over here, which I think is one of the things we needed for a quest. We need one population surplus and we also need to spend 2,000 gold, as well as three turns over here. So we can go ahead and do that. Doing this increases the income generated. Uh, at the higher level, no, we get one plaque per level regardless. We do get more growth and more income from all buildings in this province as this levels up. Most importantly, it is this building that is the prime determinant of what sub-buildings you can build because it's your settlement level. For example, we currently have spawn pools of the lower class. This is our primary way of building our basic units over here, for example. I can't build the rank two building because it requires a level two settlement and then a level three settlement. You can see settlements can go all the way up to level five. Now, only the capital city itself can go up to level five. The secondary smaller settlements can only go up to level three. There are a couple buildings that are only buildable um, in your capital. Partially, well, there's lots that are only buildable in capital by virtue of the fact that they require, you know, really high level. So these buildings can only be built in a level five settlement, so you'll never build them in the smaller ones. There's a few that might only be buildable um, in your capital because they require your capital, even if they're not higher level. And there are some buildings that are based on a particular resource. For example, my capital has access to gold. We can actually see the little symbol here, which means that these gold mines can only be built in this particular city. Well, and not necessarily one of these others. Most of the cities have some sort of unique resource though. So there's that kind of thing. Now there is a handy button over here, building browser. will show you the entirety of all the buildings that are available. Um, see, uh, organized by rank tier, and then you can sort of plan a little bit over here. Ideally, in our capital, as this levels up, we'll get more slots. We have up to seven, uh, sorry, nine building slots over here. And of the ones that need the higher ranks, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, I guess 10. There's effectively 10 different buildings that you need to rank four or above. Um, and we don't have that many slots in here, uh, but that's okay. We don't necessarily need to build everything here. At some point, we'll get another capital city. One of the things we'll probably prioritize, especially in our first capital city, is trying to unlock all the types of units. So some of the buildings have little units in the top right corner over here. This is what gets unlocked. So if we build the Pterodon Hatchery, it is a rank three building, which means it could be built in a secondary uh, um, settlement. We will gain access to the Pterodon Riders. If we have the Pterodon Hatchery as well as you can see a little highlighting mouse over here, the Weapon Crafters Commune, we'll then be able to build uh, fire Le Pterodon Riders with Fire Leech Bolas. Now, it's important to note that you don't need the Pterodon Hatchery and the Weapon Crafters Commune to be in the same city, simply the same province. So it means I can build the Pterodon Hatchery, say here, and then build the Weapon Crafters Commune in my capital over here to unlock more of these types of things. Um, so I think it'll more or less be relatively obvious how we're going to develop the buildings. I'm a big fan of trying to get the, uh, the food buildings in every single city up until I, I, I max out my capital to level five, at which point I then sell these buildings and replace them with something else. Maybe that's a good way to go. Maybe it's not. I'm not sure. Um... So in terms of units, the thing, one of the things to remember with the, with the Lizardmen here is that there are, um, there are, I don't know, I guess a handful of different sub races, which I mentioned. The lowest tier ones are the Skinks. Skinks are relatively small. They're relatively intelligent, and relatively dexterous. They're good for a lot of crafting tasks, that sort of thing, um, in your empire. Um, they're, they're, you know, they're relatively smart. They handle a lot of of the day-to-day -day activities. They are the smartest, except for the Slon themselves. So the Slon are extremely rare and extremely powerful. They're sort of leaders that honestly are sort of dormant most of the time. Um, so yeah, they handle most of the everyday tasks over here. They're tiny, They're so, I think they're kind of goblin sized, something of that nature. So these are the Skink um, order over here. When we do get to this top rank building over here, assuming we also have the Weapon Crafters Commune, uh, we can start to produce Croxagores over here. Croxidors are big and strong, They're like giant crocodiles. Uh, and apparently they do the spawn in the same place or the same types of waves maybe. 
as the skinks and they act um, when they're not fighting, I think they act a lot of time like beasts of burdens and things like that. The other branch are the Sauruses over here, which, again, very dinosaur-like. They're like the primary sort of frontline fighters, you know, big, savage, brutal beasts over here. Um, you can see these lower level ones both have the primal instinct trait, which means they actually do have a tendency to break in combat, just go crazy and go on a rampage. Um, that doesn't mean that they like run away. It's quite the opposite. They will just chase down enemies regardless, but they will break apart your carefully constructed battle lines. Whether or not that proves to be a problem really depends on how the flow of the battle is going. The better trained sources do not have that problem. Uh, you do. You don't. There we go. The source spears do not have that problem with breaking, but apparently these source warriors do. And later on, we can get to the temple guards, super elite units. They've got the halberds over here very strong we can do proper comparison on another screen over here but they're quite powerful they, they still count as spears so like they're good against you know uh resisting against charges and that sort of thing um the halberds do require the weapon builders commune so quite popular and then we've got the source scar veterans over here this is a, unlocking a hero type that we can then go ahead and deploy now Oh, we've got some more heroes over here the skink priests that can do some various things uh another variant of skink priests over here but What's really tempting to me is the beast lair over here. This entire chain of beast type lairs for Greek beasts. This is where you get your dinosaurs, which can act as like sort of mounts or sort of giant siege units and so on and so forth. We get these stegodons at first. Now these are just classified as monsters. They are very highly armored. 120 armor and I think 140 armor here for the feral bestilodon. Really 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 tanky beasts very armored they cause terror uh, they can go on a rampage as well so they break loose and I, there's just a single one of these in an army just a single big monster over here um and so one of the questions is can you just like have an army that's just based on these guys i guess it can be countered by a lot of anti-large because i assume these guys count as large although i don't really see that trait specifically illustrated so uh spears are still going to be bad news against these guys because i think most spear people um have that yeah at that anti-large ability over here so it might be kind of dangerous next up we've got artillery type units over here um that can fire so again still giant dinosaur people are going to be riding on its back and firing things out of this the bastilodon over here uh has a beam of kotak i believe this is a straightforward beam it doesn't like arc up it's not indirect fire so i don't think it's very useful when you're attacking cities but it sure as heck looks impressive um, in regular combat over here. Lots of damage. And again, cause terror to a lot of units um, because they are big and scary. Uh, here's a Bastilodon with a Revivication Crystal, which protects those who worship the Serpent God, healing wounds, and bringing supplicants back from the point of death. Unbelievably cool support unit over here. And still a badass fighter. 140 armor. Lots and lots of hit points. Excellent. Finally, we get the Feral Carnosaur over here. Specifically has anti-large, which is interesting. Has an advantage against targets that are at least as large as a horse. So we have a giant dinosaur that's good at fighting other big giant things. Basically sort of like Godzilla versus Mothra thing going on or something. I don't know. And then the ancient Stegodon over here. Specialist artillery can fire while moving. I don't think the others had that uh, specifically listed. So, you know, shooting on the run. The skinks are on there. They're throwing javelins, and they also have heavy siege weapons at the same time. I like this. They're just as good in melee as their feral counterparts, but no longer prone to rampaging, and they have all the range attacks over here. So, big, giant beasties. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, early on, obviously, our armies are mostly going to be comprised of probably like little skinks, right? Like if we take a look at what we could actually recruit over here, what we have. Well, so we have Lord Mazdamundi in here. Now, he's not going to be as much of a fighter, although he can. He hovers around. Oh, we should take a look at his possible upgrades. But he's a spellcaster, which is very exciting because in my practice campaign, I was playing the dwarves and we didn't really have a whole lot of spellcasters. We've also got one unit of temple guards over here. Again, they're very well uh, equipped. Um, very, very smart. Uh, can we pin these guys here? Because I just want to look at their stats. If I, like, right-click? No, that's just going to open the wiki page, which doesn't work right now anyway. Uh, because it's still pre-release. We'll take a look at them on another screen. We've got these Saurus Warriors, a Mace Infantry, and again, they've got that Primal Instincts over there, so they're ready to break. We've got these Skink Cohorts. They throw Javelins. They've only got three tosses of Javelins each. 
Um, so uh, they do run out of that quite quickly, and then they're going to want to close to melee. They are shielded, and they also have poison attacks, which is quite cool. The aquatic is kind of interesting, too. Most units fight worse if they're sitting in pools of water. That does not apply to the skinks. I think the skinks only um, in the Lizardmen army, but that might be kind of relevant to certain things. And we do start off with one of these Bastilladons with the solar engine. It's the giant laser beam of doom over here. Very, very fun initial composition for army. Really like that. So if we take a look at our Lord over here, our character details, and we take a look at his upgrade tree. Um, it's pretty, pretty typical sort of layout that we've seen in Warhammer 1, as well as the breakdown. Down here, we've got a lot of campaign map boosts. So these are benefits um, that your lord provides, say, to a province that he's standing in, for example. Uh, yeah, eh, cheaper upkeep. That's interesting. Here was success chance reduced down over here. Uh, Route Marcher, I'm totally sold on the idea that this is a really, really, really amazing trait to let you traverse the map faster as well as catch people more frequently or escape people more frequently. That's going to be a high presence. I still like the idea of further boosting our leadership aura um, just to try to prevent people from breaking around the Lord. It's one of the things I use Lords most for. And then over here, we've got a lot of things that buff your other units that are nearby. Uh, by type that you might want to tune for different things. Uh, it's weapon strength for Stegodons and Bastilladon units. Crazy. That rally ability, very good. And then it's just more more and more and more boosting of your various units ending in the Slon force field over here. Very cool. Then you've got his more active abilities. And he is not a melee combat kind of unit. He, in fact, is a heavy-duty spellcaster. So we can lock a harmonic convergence over here, for example. You drop this on yourself or an ally. Gives them a huge boost to melee defense, armor, and melee attack. Very, very nice. Now, it does have that 50% miscast chance over here. In fact, uh, a lot of these abilities, there's another one that have the miscast chance. Now, if we go to Soul of Stone over here, we reduce the miscast based chance, which to me seems like a pretty high priority, in my opinion. So get the magic resistance over here and then pick up the miscast based chance at level 8 just to make it more uh, reliable. Uh, Rolling Sky is interesting. It's actually a permanent aura. Um, it's map wide, and what it does is it debuffs your um, any enemy flying units. Enemy flying units get a massive debuff against you over here. So you, you probably don't need to prioritize that because I don't know how many flying units you'll see early on, but if people start deploying that against you, then you've got that. Uh, ap apotheosis? Apotheosis? Apotheosis. There it is. Apotheosis over here is a healing spell over here that also causes a fear aura around your target, which is kind of spiffy. I'm a big fan of the net of a Mintuck over here. It lasts 30 seconds it's an area of effect and it causes people to be unable to move as the two armies are coming together to clash together if you drop this you can catch a couple of units uh with relative ease with this and stop them from being able to come to the front line which enables you to get a two-on-one or three-on-one combo on the people who do move forward or set up more flanks so on and so forth curse the midnight wind over here uh ground enemies 50 second duration reduces armor reduces melee attack like it, it's all it's all like this it's just a huge amount of spell power some of which is more offensive some of which is more defensive there's those there's also a series of powers over here if you take this branch here that gives you more winds of magic power reserve decreases enemy power reserve over here you eventually get to the focus of mysteries which gives you the banishment spell um causes magical damage large moving area effect it's strong versus multiple enemies over here and then the ruination of cities um which you can't actually cast on a wall so it's kind of interesting uh only lasts seven seconds but it causes magical damage three strong damaging rifts spread outward strong versus multiple units i haven't gotten a chance to use these yet but i'm very excited the bits at the top are quest based uh, well, some of them are quest-based, some of them are not. These, I guess, are locked from quests over here, uh, which can unlock some more abilities once again. And over here, we can unlock the ability to have a, 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 a mount, the largest Stegodon to be found anywhere. As Lack has served Lord Maznamundi faithfully for almost 500 years. Then we've got Missile Resistance and Magic Resistance over here. So, probably what I'll do, I'll probably pick up Route Marcher, and... I'll probably still pick up Inspiring Presence because I really love the, like, really gratuitous amount of leadership that you get from this. But then I'll probably focus almost exclusively on magic, including Soul of Stone 
and maybe in fact getting the the magic reserves here so we can spam this a lot more we'll probably unlock a few we'll probably well we'll have to get a harmonic convergence to unlock this group and then maybe get one rank of apotheosis and the net of emmentuck over here um and maybe even the curse of the midnight wind i'm not sure and then go and get the uh, make sure we got Soul of Stone, and then just get the Arcane Power over here, and then see what these abilities are, and see how it goes. So that's sort of generally my plan for letting up, uh, leveling up Lord Mazda Mundi. Now this video has gone on for 30 minutes, so I think what we're going to do is we're going to put a cut in here, and what I'm going to do in the next video is we're going to look at the stats of more of the units, maybe a little bit more in-depth, and talking about military composition. And we'll do that from the battle screen. I expect the next video will probably be a little bit shorter because we've already glanced at some of the units along the way. Uh, but we can start to think about maybe what kind of setup we've got. Uh, we are clearly a little bit shy on a pure ranged units in this army. I mean, we've got some, some ability to throw some spears. Uh, we'll also, if we look at the riding units, we've got a couple of units there that can, like, shoot and move. But other than that, you're, you're really having to look at the uh, the mounted, like, the specialist artillery, the ones on dinosaurs, um, in terms of, um, of range. So that, I suspect, should have a pretty serious influence on how we compose our army, and I'm very much looking forward to the feedback on that. But I will put a cut in here, stop this from getting too long. Next episode, uh, we'll take a look at the, uh, the units a little bit more closely. Thanks for watching, folks. See you then.